last week at this time, I came in and was uh, uh, less than pleased with the speaker's actions. We had gone four weeks and the speaker had not put one member of the Democratic caucus's bill on the floor counter, let alone on the floor to be heard. Um, after some discussions with leadership over the last several days, uh, I, the speaker and his leadership team uh, reversed course and have put uh, well over 30 bills uh, from my members that passed out of committee on the House floor. And just as I was, was willing to be upset and express that last week, I want to express my appreciation to the speaker. My caucus wants to express our appreciation, the fact that he listened to our concerns and is willing to work in a bipartisan manner uh, as we had the first four weeks uh, to, to get things accomplished in the state. And so we want to make, I want to make sure I tip my cap to the speaker. After my concerns were aired uh, publicly, and the speaker and I shared, shared some, some messages back and forth, and then we spoke with uh, members of his leadership team and expressed sort of what we were looking for. Uh, we just wanted um, a, a recognition that our legislation that came out of committee with overwhelming bipartisan support get the same, uh, get the same treatment that members of the majority party get. Uh, they agreed to do that, and we are grateful for it. And, uh, and so far, things have run smoothly. Matter of fact, I would say outside of that uh, disagreement between the speaker and myself last Thursday, uh, this is the smoothest first five weeks of a legislative session um, that I've ever experienced in my 10 years. It was just announced that uh, with, the, with the new revenue failure, the second revenue failure since January, uh, the governor is looking at some $260 million or $65 million worth of additional cuts to core functions of government. Uh, I believe the numbers are these, that si be since the revenue failures have been acted uh, since January, uh, public education has been cut about $110 million. The, the health care authority has been cut nearly $64 million, and the Department of Mental Health has been cut by nearly $23 million. Uh, and on top of that, you have something like the, the Department of Transportation that's been cut by over $30 million. Uh, our state, our state budget at least, is in crisis. Um, at the end of last session, the legislative leaders and the governor promised our educators, those who take care of our, our vulnerable and our sick in our hospital, hospital system, they promised them that they would have a certain amount of money by which to serve our citizens, our children, our seniors, our veterans. And unfortunately, because of um, some factors with out, of, out of their control and some factors within their control, bad budgeting practices, um, they've now forced those, uh, those agencies, those pub our public schools and our hospitals, to take deep cuts. And so today, the House Democratic Caucus is calling upon the governor and legislative leadership to immediately tap the rainy day fund to fix the current revenue failure. While I know the governor wants to wait and use those dollars in the next budget year, uh, at this point in time, especially in, a, in an area like pub, our public schools, where over 85 percent of the dollars that go to public schools are put into, into uh, personnel, teachers and support staff, most of our school districts cannot afford to take the kind of cuts that the governor is asking them to take at this particular time. And since uh, it wasn't their fault that they were given these budget cuts, it wasn't their fault that they were told what money they would have at the end of last May, it's time for the legislative leaders who helped create this problem to step up and fix that problem by immediately tapping the rainy day fund so that we don't have, so the schools don't have to cut teachers and increase class sizes larger than they already are. You're looking at longer wait lines at, at, at hospitals, uh, and to have access for health care. If you're a veteran, it's a, longer, it's a longer wait line to get access for your veterans' benefits. If you're a public school student, you're looking at larger class sizes. Uh, if you're a public school teacher, you're looking at having to take on more students. Um, and, and you may be somebody in, a, in support staff, for example, in our public schools who may be looking at losing their job altogether. Uh, when it comes to the Department of Transportation, if they continue to, to sustain the cuts that have been uh, uh, levied against them, uh, you're looking at delaying projects. Uh, either at the, at the state level or the county level. Uh, so that means more delays in, in, in getting the roads and bridges repairs that need to be done around the state. So it, it, it has a broad sweeping effect on every citizen in the state of Oklahoma. We will work with them if they will work with us. We know what got us here. The fact that somebody's not paying an extra dollar fifty on the cigarette tax or the fact that somebody uh, isn't, isn't uh, paying a, a tax on their haircut is not what got us in a $1.3 billion hole. We're in a $1.3 billion hole and we cut public education funding when the price was over $100 a barrel because of gross production taxes and income tax cuts. And until they address those issues, we're going to say, no, you can't raise taxes on middle class families. So if they want to work with us, then they'll work with us in a way that actually addresses the, the, the root of the problem, what got us here, not just uh, willy-nilly raising tax on middle-class families to try to offset their cuts for special interests. As it pertains to public education, 
We've said for the last several weeks that our caucus is uh, unified and firmly opposed to um, Representative Nelson's efforts to uh, institute vouchers in our public school system. At a time in which the Department of Education is already being cut by $110 million, his legislation, according to those folks that we trust within the School Board Association, could cost, could cost the, our public school system over $250 million. Our caucus has been unified against that bill, and we hope that the bill doesn't see the light of day next week. And then if it does, that a bipartisan effort will oppose it. But we want to take a moment to highlight uh, what the power of the people. Uh, there was a young lady, a teacher, a media specialist, a librarian, in, in essence, down in Altus, in the Altus Public Schools, Kaylee Thornbrew. She sent a letter to us and all the members of the legislature. Uh, and, and it was signed by over 888 uh, teachers from not just Altus, but from all around the state. And it, it, it details specifically why voucher plans would be bad for, for schools like hers in Altus. And she calls upon, and these are Democrats, Republicans, and independents, and they call upon all of us to do all we can to beat back that bill because to cut, uh, to institute a plan that could cut $250 million out of the public school system by giving those private, by giving those tax dollars to private schools at a time in which public schools have been cut by hundreds of millions of, of dollars is unconscionable. We want Kaylee to know that, that we stand uh, that we stand with her and her teachers, that sh not only in Altus but all across the state, who share her same concerns. Our caucus is growing ever more frustrated with the uh, majority party's attempt to politicize the judicial nominating system more than it already is. Uh, they've, uh, they've argued that there's, there needs to be reforms to the Judicial Nominating Commission to try to make sure we have more qualified people um, uh, placed on the, our court system. I'll be very honest with you, the legislation that passed off the floor today, authored by the Speaker of the House, in which we change from a system in which just the three most qualified names are offered up to the governor to be selected, from that to just anybody, virtually anybody that applies, can now be selected. So now we've gone from a system in which the most qualified folks, not the most well-connected, but the most qualified uh, attorneys in the state or judges could be appointed to the, to the bench, to a system in which you could be the 35th worst uh, attorney that applied, but as long, even if you're a bad lawyer, if you're a good check writer to the right people, you could be nominated to the bench. And so what, what that legislation has done is not to move the, system, move the uh, court system uh, towards a more open and transparent uh, and less partisan system, it's actually moved it uh, in, in the wrong direction. In our caucus, we opposed it today. It passed, unfortunately, off the House. We hope that the Senate will see fit to amend it or to defeat it outright. If anybody's paying attention to what's happening to the, to the Justice Scalia uh, situation and his replacement situation in Washington, uh, you've got Democrats and Republicans who are making that, th that, that replacement hyper-partisan. Uh, there's a potential that the highest, most powerful court in the United States of America could have a vacancy on it for over a year and a half. And that's because of the partisan politics played on both sides of the aisle that happened around the judicial nominating process for the Supreme Court in Washington. Our perspective is, is as, we, as we oftentimes um, talk about how bad the process, the political process is in Washington, why in the world would we want to adopt uh, the Washington-style form of, of appointing judges here in Oklahoma. I have yet to hear Governor Fallon come out and say there was one judge that she's appointed that she didn't like, that she didn't think was either conservative enough or qualified enough. That no, matter of fact, not one time has anybody running this legislation offered up one name of a particular judge that the Governor Fallon has, has appointed or been offered to her that said these people aren't qualified. And so I really think it is a solution in search of a problem in, 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 one, in one aspect, and it really is an effort by some very powerful folks in Oklahoma to try to control the Supreme Court. There was one Supreme Court vacancy in the state of Pennsylvania. That election, that one election, had over $16.5 million spent in that election. The people of Oklahoma don't want Supreme Court justices for sale. My caucus does want me to extend um, our thoughts and prayers and condolences to the Aubrey McClendon family. Uh, Aubrey was um, an enormous figure in our, in our state, in our city, did incredible things for, for Oklahoma City. Uh, it is, his loss is tragic. Um, his philanthropic and generous spirit was really rivaled by very few in our state. And, uh, and so we really do uh, hope and pray that, that God will comfort uh, his family during what we know is an, an exceedingly difficult time for them.